of hemp makes 20 barrels of oil. Mm. Don't need four pesticides to poison all our soil. People got no food, they got no clothes, they got no rent. Thank you for taking Time for Hemp. I'm your host, Casper Leach. You are listening to Time for Hemp all around the world on Tumblr, SoundCloud, iTunes, iHeartRadio. Anywhere there is sound found on the internet, we are found making sound. And we are putting a spotlight today on the amazing people at LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. My joint host today is always Lenny Freely. Good morning, Your Honor. Casper, what a pleasure as always. Good morning. And Dave Doddridge, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Dave, good morning. It, Thank you for inviting me. Our pleasure. Talk radio with just me talking, kind of boring. Yes, he's kind of an exciting guy. <laughs> yeah, but it's a good sound bite, so what the hell, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you were with the Coast Guard in 1998, starting in 98. Is that correct? No. Are you talking to me? Well, <laughs> you know what, Dave? Let's talk about you. Instead of somebody else who's on my screen. <laughs> uh, and I'm no, I'm, I'm not smoking. I'm not imbibing. It is just me. I don't know if I should admit that, but. <laughs> okay. Well, I first got in, I first got involved in uh, law enforcement when I got drafted in the army. And that was back in oh, gee, the early seventies. And uh, actually, late, the yeah, very early 70s, the Vietnam War was winding down. They made me a military policeman. Uh, the reason they did that is because I had already applied for the Los Angeles Police Department and and uh, been accepted. <laughs> but before I could get in the academy, the draft board decided they wanted me first. And so I went there as a military policeman and um, kind of introduced into drugs, uh, not personally, but the drug war itself. Uh, as you know, in the military, especially in Vietnam, there were a lot of drugs being used, and uh, it was being carried over stateside. So I got into that. Legal, legal and illegal in Vietnam. We had illegal marijuana and hashish and all the varieties right. being right, right at the Golden Triangle there. And additionally, my understanding is we had the military um, using arguably appropriately um, amphetamines, both for pilots to keep them awake on long flights. I think most people would agree that's probably a good idea. Um, and in general, to boost performance, even though long term, our fighting men right. and women may have come out behind short term. You I, need to stay right. awake. I, I, I saw yes. a study on that once, and it was the, the doses that our soldiers received over there, or the pilots received, was about the same amount that the uh, uh, Wehrmacht received on the Eastern Front in, in Germany in World War II. Uh, as you know, they used to use that on their soldiers there to keep them going uh, long days and nights. So it's apparently uh, countries do that. They, they don't care too much about their men. They just want them out there fighting and shooting and dying. Well, just um, just to play devil's advocate for a moment, not reflecting my personal beliefs, an argument could be made that it is an appropriate tool of war, and an argument could be made that fewer people die with that approach. Now, it's kind of an easy argument for me if we're looking just at, say, pilots on a long run uh -huh. but you know well, rules of war always struck me as a bizarre kind of concept uh, are there rules in war I, I read the phrase I read the phrase the reality I think is there's only one rule win there are no other rules. There are things you can get caught doing that are embarrassing or illegal. But rules? 
Yeah. No, you've got to win at all costs. Once you get involved in a war, uh, yeah, a real war. Well, I don't, I don't mean these petty wars, you know. But, uh, oh man, we can't even tell the difference anymore. We don't want to win a war like that. Just like the war on drugs. Absolutely, there's so much money to be made on it. Just like the military-industrial complex on a on a physical war. There's so much money, so much corruption, uh, so much graft. Uh, so much insider trading on the war on drugs that nobody wants to win that. Really? <laughs> it's, it's just too much to be made on that thing. From the top to the bottom. Yes, yes, but just four more years, can't we win? Four more years, wouldn't we win the war on drugs and none of our civilians would be illegally purchasing street drugs and getting addicted and ruining families and ruining lives? Just four more years would do it, wouldn't it? Oh, I think we could do it tomorrow if they <laughs> legalize them. Uh-huh. You know, that's, what, that's, what, that's what Leap's premise is, of course. You know, then we, then we can regulate it and we can treat drug addicts, uh, you know, the way they should be treated without having to worry about going to prison. Uh, oh, you uh, mean, we, say, treating a medical issue like a medical issue? Yes. For that's those, pretty radical. Those that have a real problem with it need to be, you know, they can volunteer for treatment centers. And, uh, yeah, it'd work out much more better than, uh, much more better, that doesn't tell you. Much better than, uh, you know, incarceration. I like much more better in that sentence, actually. (laughs) Okay. That worked fine for me. Let me ask you this. You, You have been in fighting, you have been involved personally in fighting the drug war, and now on both sides originally fighting the war now fighting for the peace fair statement yeah. why'd you well, change after, your yes yes well after i after i got out of the army i went into the los angeles police department and, and i did 21 years there um Damn. And the last uh, the last uh, five years was working narcotics it's actually on, on the street kicking doors and uh, you know jamming guns in people's ears and Laying them on the floor and hauling off their kids and their fathers to jail. 21, 21 years, LAPD? Yes. All right. Now, let me tell our listeners what we already know. We know that there is no crime in Los Angeles. We know there is no such thing as South LA. We know there's no gang activity. And we know because of the great success of the war on drugs over. Uh, Let's put it at 100 years plus if we want to go back to Anslinger and Hearst and the like, early 1900s, when all these previously legal things began the, tr- the trend to illegal. So we've been doing this a long time. You've been on both sides. Fair statement? Yes. Exactly. And, exactly. So you, you've, been on the, you've been on LAPD. Is... Right. I can't. I can't imagine a police department that would give you more immersion, eye to eye, hand to hand, face to face, day in day out, to the war on drugs. Uh, am I hearing that right? Yeah, you're hearing it right. It was, we, we were right there. My squad was in South Los Angeles. We worked out of a uh, 77th Street Division, uh, which is South Bureau Dope down there, and. Uh, Every day, it was, you know, don't, don't, don't. Uh, arresting them, fighting them, hauling them off, getting search warrants, get, you know, spying on them, so, getting search warrants, and then, then knocking down the doors and taking them down the house. Uh, so you, yeah, yeah, you... Go ahead, please. Almost every day. We'd be up there at nights with our battering rams and, and doing it. And, and what a futile effort that was. You know, Tell me like about the, that. You know, you know, it's like you get, you're in a car with six other guys, and you got your battering ram in your your lap, and uh, you go hauling up to a house because you know what we used to do. <laughs> we used to, uh, to be able to locate where they're selling drugs. Uh, I, I had a black friend named uh, Rupert, and uh, he was looked like a base head, and uh, we drive an old Volkswagen van up and down Figueroa Street, and uh, I'd hide in the back behind the curtain. And, and on Bigger Old Street, there were a lot of what we call strawberries, prostitutes. And uh, and so he'd pick up one, 
and then you say, hey, you know, let's see, let's let's hit some dope before we go do our thing, and where are they selling it? And she say, oh, down the road, I'll make a right turn, second house on the left, and we go up there. He'd give her twenty bucks if she go up and buy some coke uh, or whatever, and uh, Good come morning. back with it. I'm recording He'd a show. He'd drive a couple blocks away, and then he, Let me call you back and I'd open up the court and say, "Surprise, surprise!" And uh, they go, "Oh shoot, Tommy, shoot!" And and then uh, we both know what they uh, said, and it wasn't the I'm latter. Okay. Yeah, and so then uh, we'd say, "Okay, well, we don't want I'm you out, because I'm we're out not of working herb. You know, I'm out anyway." Of herb. So we kicked um, the I'm over drunk. I'm over I'm over drunk at the dope. bank and shit like that. And but then we go my get, biggest uh, problem if it was I'm in a blood area. We go so. get a uh, crib. Uh, we had informants on both sides, uh, you know, and people wanted All right, money. And then if it was a crib area, we go get a blood. And uh, one of our CIs, we could you know do the thing legal, uh, check them out. First come down, make sure you didn't have any dope, send them in there, buy dope, come back out, make out an affidavit, go get a search warrant, and then take down the house that night. So CI, so, conf- another, yeah. CI confidential so, informant, right? Yeah, CI confidential informant, right. And, and so we uh, we did that a lot, and, and so you, you got a picture driving down the street, you know, you all get together ahead of time. And uh, we've, there's four squads there, and each squad's out doing the same thing we're doing, uh, their own methods of finding out the locations. And, and then so we'd get together, and they'd say, okay, we're going to take this house on this street. Uh, you take the front, you take the back, you take the, the bathroom window, and uh, because, you know, see, well, there's a reason for that, because they like to flush it. As soon, as soon as they hear anything, they'll flush it. And so you go around the bathroom window and break the window and throw in a car firecrackers or something to keep them away from the bathroom. And uh, so anyway, you go down the street, and here's the house, and you jump out of the car. Now, back in those days, you had to give them 30 seconds notice that to open the front door. Well, uh, if you know South L.A., almost all of them barricaded. Even the good people are barricaded in. And uh, so we would pull up and get on the loudspeaker, you know, uh, police officers open up the door, and... Uh, and by the time we got out of the car and got to the front door, about 30 seconds had passed. So without further ado, it's the battering ram on the door. And we take it down. And I don't know if you know what it's like to run into a house like that. And everybody's screaming, especially if the whole family's there and watching TV. And all of a sudden, you come bashing through the door. Somebody's running through the back, and the little kids are screaming. The mom's trying to hold them down, and we're yelling, everybody on the floor, everybody on the floor, guns drawn. And, uh, you know, then, and then you search the house. And in those days, we used to tear the house apart, literally, pile everything on the living room floor, go through everything. You just have to leave a mess in order to find a few, you know, a little bit of cocaine. And often... That was all it was, you know, just a, you know, a couple of grams of, of cocaine, and then uh, or ounces, and then uh, you haul the guy away. Usually, it was their son or their dad or somebody. It was in there that was doing it. Often, not to the knowledge of the rest of the people in the house, but that didn't matter. And then uh, take them away. And I got to thinking, well, I don't know, there's something wrong with this picture. I joined up, you know, the LAPD because I wanted to help society. I wanted to. Be you know, the rest of the bad guys. And I did a lot of that the first, uh, you know, 15, 16 years on the job. You know, I worked robbery, I worked theft, I worked uh, auto theft, worked, uh, you know, sex crimes, and uh, plus, you know, six years on the street patrol. And, and I tried to be as good a cop as possible, but I just had a sour feeling taste in my mouth after a while doing this. It did something wrong. And besides, we're not making a dent. You need to talk more directly into your mic there, David. That leads me directly into my next question, which you've kind of answered, but I'll ask it again anyway. You were working narcotics a long time, years and years and years. If we looked at your impression of the availability of illicit drugs on the street when you started, compared to when you moved on from that particular part of your life. 
Did it make a dent? And I'm not asking you personally. I'm asking you as somebody that was there as part of a squad, which was part of a number of squads, the whole picture, putting it all together, all those man and woman hours, the taping, the listening, and on and on and on. Was there significantly, as far as you could tell, was there significantly less illicit drug trafficking when you left that part of your life compared to when you jumped in? Oh, no. Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. In fact, if it, anything, it's, uh, there was more. Uh, <laughs> and then that, toward the end of my career, the feds decided to get involved. And so they wanted to give us all these Velcro holsters and, you know, all this other helmets and stuff to make us look like soldiers and, rather than cops. And because uh, we used to just wear our regular plain clothes, you know, and uh, so they got involved and started giving us all this free stuff. And, uh, so I, I left South Los Angeles and I went up to the valley. And, uh, up there, I, I joined the uh, what's called the filing team and uh, narcotics filing team. And, and we, what we did was, uh, I worked there for about a year and a half, almost two years. Um, all arrests, all narcotics arrests in the, in the San Fernando Valley would come to us. And we would look at them and analyze them, decide whether to take them to the district attorney for filing. And uh, so that's what that's what we did. And, and it, we'd all, every morning, we'd get there about four in the morning and have to put them together for the DA. Every morning there must have been, you know, there's anywhere from two to ten for each of us in there. And we'd have to go and make copies for the DA and all but there was, uh, so the district attorney's office was not far from us. We'd walk over there and do them. But there was a thing LAPD has, I guess it's not LAPD, it's the state of California, where as a detective analyzing a drug arrest, if he determines that there's not enough probable cause, that it's not a good filing, uh, he can write out what's called an 849B1 which uh, just dismisses the case right there. He has the power, not, before it even gets the DA or the judge, he can just dismiss it right there. And so ha I, I became known in that unit as the 849B1 king. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in fact, when I retired, they gave me a picture of myself with a little crown on the top of the, the king. You know, um, They didn't like it too much, but they realized that most everybody in there realized that you got to file a certain amount. But I'll tell you what, you know, if there was, if you could not connect the dope to the person, or if there was it's just any, you know, anything that looked like you, you weren't going to get a good filing on this thing, I'd kick it loose. And, uh, for instance, we would have officers that would see people standing next to a stone wall. And, uh, you know, in a bad neighborhood, and they'd walk up to them and say, what's going on, and here's some dope. It's, you know, laying on top of the stone wall. Now, whose dope is this? Not mine, not mine, not mine. And so they'd rest it, right, because it's right there in plain sight. And i go, wait a minute, you, you, can't, you can't prove that. <laughs> so I'd kick them loose, <laughs> you know. Uh, That's just a typical example of that. When I was anyway, sitting on... When I was sitting on the bench as an associate judge, City of Lafayette, Colorado, one of the things I did was a trial. A kid, 17, 16, a kid was being prosecuted in Muni court for possession of pot. The pot was in a brown paper bag sitting next to him on a public park bench. Took, took it to trial. Now, I... I would look you in the eye and say that for a possession of pot case, my burden of proof was high. I know what beyond a reasonable doubt means. Right. And I really knew what it meant in drug cases. I walked the kid. I said, you have no evidence. It was his that he knew what was in it. All you have is a bag sitting next to him on a bench, not guilty. Now, that's a case. It sounds like you may have at least seriously considered flushing, giving it a 27B stroke six from Brazil, an 849B1, and saved everyone yeah. 
wasted energy. This stupid case went to trial. Good, good for you. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I had it. I had. Go ahead. I'm working on listening. It's it's very difficult for me. I had another pot case. 16 year old kid attempting to coerce his 14 year old sister and her 14 year old friend to smoke pot with him. He already knew the friend was vehemently opposed to anything in that area. He got convicted. On the one hand, they had enough evidence. He was convicted. On the other hand, I think the real reason I convicted him was not even for trying to offer the pot, pardon my language, for just being a jerk. You get to a point in being a jerk where it does become criminal, in my mind. And offering your 14-year-old sister and her friend pot, I think that's criminal. I have no trouble with that as most of us don't. Well, I don't know. You know, I, I've arrested hundreds, if not a thousand, um, people for drugs. Narcotics. Damn. Wow. And, and uh, you know, over and over, well, myself, my squad, you know, or me personally, or along with my squad, arrested so many people. And uh, we would kind of justify it. we justify the, you know, PCP. Uh, you have to justify what you're doing. Because what you're doing is really bad. And, and I guess like a soldier in war, you know, when you see people getting blown up and killed, you have to somehow just, oh, what you're doing, you go crazy. And so... Well, that's you know, what most... Well, yeah, PCP, well, they're, they're out fighting. Uh, they're arguing and fighting with people and they can hurt people because they got that, that, they're extra strong. They don't feel any pain. LSD, you know, they're going to run in tra traffic and because they take off their clothes and run around. And same with PCP. And if you arrest a heroin suspect or a, a cocaine or meth or somebody else, well, we just fight it. They're burglars. They're thieves. And so if we arrest one of them, we're, we're taking a thief off the, the streets. Right? But marijuana was a whole different game. I could never figure out why we were arresting people with marijuana. Those Nobody has. Were, no, they, they, they mowed their lawns. And they sat around and chatted, and they didn't do, they weren't doing anything. <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking, why in the world we were, you know, it was just, you know, you, I could not justify that. I could not. I've, I've given PCP a lot of thought, specifically because the LEAP position, legalize, tax, regulate, and deal with it as a health problem seem to me intellectually to hit kind of a stumbling block with PCP a little harder to defend legalizing something that we at least believe causes very bad dangerous physical assaultive behavior how does that fit in what I what I have seen over 20 30 years now I don't know when first PCP came on the scene 20 years ago maybe the yeah. last time I ran into a case where the word PCP was even mentioned was so many years ago, I can't tell you how many, but I can say it, it has to be 10. It has to be more. And what it makes me wonder, hypothesize, is if there is a drug such as PCP, which is apparently particularly dangerous to all of us who are not doing it. Here's what I've seen that fascinates me. It seems to have vanished. Nobody talks about it. There are no newspaper articles about it. Law enforcement doesn't talk about it. And it does make me wonder for those few things that are out there that we'd probably look at and say, yeah, th that's probably a pretty bad drug. And if we could make that gone, that'd probably be a pretty good thing. But it seems PCP made itself go away. I would argue, hypothesize, that even people who want to get high, even drug addicts, there's some type of group mentality which is not simply stupid. 
something else is going on. I can't say more about it than that, except that thought does keep crossing my mind. You know, you you made a point there. I never, you never really considered that, but you're right. I've not heard of CCP around here or anywhere else for quite a few years now. It just seems to have disappeared. I don't know whether the government's dried up the pipeline or if the government was involved in that. They seem to be in, in a lot of other stuff. Um, or if people are just getting smart out there or what it is. But uh, you're right. Well, one, like thing that's, it, one thing that has disappeared is the first half of this show. And we're going to take a commercial break and pay our bills. Then we'll come back and pick up where we left off here at Time for Hemp. You are listening to the Time for Hemp Global Broadcasting Network. Please share us with your friends. THCF Medical Clinics are the premier physician's clinic in the United States. THCF has offices all across the United States from Hawaii to Michigan. THCF Medical Clinics has helped approximately 150,000 patients obtain their medical marijuana permits to legally possess, grow, and use medical marijuana. If you have chronic pain, multiple sclerosis, or any other neurological degenerative disease, or if you have any gastro intestinal disorders such as GERD, irritable bowel syndrome, or if you have AIDS, cancer, spastic disorders, seizure disorders, or glaucoma, call us at 1-800-723-0188 or visit us online at hemp.org. Again, the number is 1-800-723-0188 and the site is hemp.org. Me ganja business, them wa 
hash it down. Sensi this, sensi that, and me hash it down. With this one, me have to get ganja from the play around. the time for him all around the world on Tumblr, SoundCloud, iTunes, iHeartRadio. We're on Roku TV, anywhere where there's a sound found on the internet. We're around making sound. It's Wednesday. On Wednesday, we try to put a spotlight on the LEAP members' law enforcement against prohibition. And my joint host is a member of LEAP. Your Honor, it's, it is a great organization, isn't it? Unbelievable. Yes, it is. And that's our well, joint I, guest. There's a bunch of dedicated people that know what's going on. And we're going to make a difference this year at LEAP. I honestly believe that there. I think they're going to get some ears up in Washington, don't you? I really do. You know, uh, Casper, it's been a while since we've talked, a couple, couple years anyway. And I remember the last time we were talking that uh, it was kind of a downer. We were just lamenting the fact that nobody seemed to want to get on board and that, uh, you know, what are we going to do? But now I, I feel so much more hopeful that uh, state after state is looking at it. Um, Leap, is, Leap is helping to drive this effort. Um, it, and, you know, I, I'm upbeat, much more upbeat now than I am before. It, it seems like we uh, got the Yankees on the run. Well, it would be nice if he went ahead and signed a, an executive order before leaving the Oval Office, but I can't imagine Obama doing that. Yeah, exactly. Well, I had some hope there, but when the uh, Defense Department, it was the Defense the Department of Justice, decided that they were going to suspend, uh, uh, you know, the equity equitable sharing program for asset forfeiture, uh, and I thought, oh wow, this is great, Holder did, you know, but it only lasted what for six months, and now they're back into making money off of stealing, stealing people's assets. So, I noticed something odd not too long ago, it was after the instructions to the DEA to spend no money going after people who were conforming to their state medical marijuana laws. You guys recall that the same way? Here's the wrinkle. Here's the wrinkle. Take the money away from the DEA, okay? What happens then when the Homeland Security people have liaisons with our local drug task forces, and Homeland Security is now apparently doing what DEA can no longer do. Oh boy, what progress, huh? (laughs) Uh, Homeland Security worries me uh, very much. Good, good. Tentacles, Tentacles are getting everywhere. And, and it's really bad. Uh, oh, man. So anyway, here in Utah, uh, for the last year, two years now, uh, Senator Madsen, uh, who has terrible back problems, has been trying to pass a medical marijuana law. Uh, and he's been pushing it, pushing it. He has to go to Colorado to treat his back. And we've twice I've been up to Salt Lake City and testified by the you know, Senate Judicial Committee uh, in, in supporting his bill. Um, the problem is, is that you, you can't. There's one main guy that's fighting it, and his Senator Vickers from Cedar City. And Senator Vickers, guess what his occupation is? DEA. He's a, pharma- He's a pharmacist. A farmer. Wow, a pharmacist. Oh, pharmacist. He's- he sells whose legal business, drugs. Whose business will be directly impacted. Yeah, yeah. In Utah, you don't, even though you, you, know, you have a conflict of interest, you can get around it by merely proclaiming that you don't have a conflict of interest. No investigation, nothing. All you have to do is say, no, there's no conflict, and, and you're done. So Vickers is fighting this like crazy. 
and uh, we had been trying and trying, and we were, you know, Senator Manson was in tears last time because they've been voting it down each year. Each year. It, you just can't, you, you can't, and we have, you should have been at the, the committee hearing and listened to the per, person after person got up there and t- told about how it healed their epileptic child, how it did this, how it did that, it eased their back pain, and, you know, and, uh, but no, no, we can't have that. We can't have that here. Just, did you, did you have visible support from PTSD troops? And the reason I ask is oh, that yeah, Go ahead. At, when we were fighting a particular battle that had to do with home grows and caregivers and other kinds of issues, it was a statewide hearing. Um, I was behind the scenes organizing so that other people played well together, I think is the best description of the critical role I'm bragging about. The biggest impact was we had military there from every war and police action going back to Korea. And I don't recall if we had World War II or if it just started with Korea one after another, after another, physical victims, mental health victims, on and on, saying, how can you tell me I can't smoke marijuana? I'm telling you, it helps me survive. I couldn't look one of those guys or ladies in the eye and say, well, screw you, I don't care. Yeah, you had people shooting at you. Yeah, we told you to do it. But you know what? You found something that'll help you. We don't care. We're too stupid to know that it helps us, and we don't care you know, enough about our troops. Yes, I'm please. I'm talk to you, because that's a brilliant idea, and I think I'll take it up with Senator Madsen for the next next year when, when we try again. That is a really good idea. How can you turn Love down it. veterans? How, How can you turn down veterans? I know. What else yeah. can they do to earn the right to medicine that makes them feel better. You can Mm. shoot people, you can shoot their heads off. They can shoot your heads off. But oh no, you can't smoke a joint. What the hell? (laughs) Especially now, and it it seems like the senators and and our legislative body, in fact, the people at large, have not woken up to the alleged baneful effects of marijuana. Um, you know, the fact they, they still believe that people are going to be crashing cars right and left. And I talked to one lady that had to travel back east, and she said they got through Colorado as quick as they could because all those marijuana drivers are running off the road. And, uh, you know, they, they're in a fantasy land. They don't, they don't realize, you know, that it, traffic fatalities have gone down. They don't realize that less kids are using it now. They don't realize that suicides are, are down and the alcohol use is down. And, you know, they don't understand this. They, they, they're still living in the 19, what was it, when Reefer Madness came out. And they're just not educated <laughs> enough. And, oh, well. and what the civilians don't know is that not only are they unaware of the facts, not surmise, but facts that you've just shared, not only do they not realize those are facts, they also don't realize that the source of the data, the source of the information is, oh yes, our state and federal government, NHTSA, National Institute of Highway Traffic Safety uh, Administration, and on and on. Our government is giving us accurate information if we would bother to look yeah, and yes, the under eight, yes, they're trying, in some cases, they're just trying to report accurately. Universally true? No. But it's out there. It's not secret. You can find it on the Internet. You can find it on leap.cc. You can yep. find it on normal.org. It's everywhere. Accurate information to the best of our knowledge. 
the death rate in Colorado from automobile accidents, I understand to be the lowest rate it has ever been. Our underage usage of pot, as you so correctly reported, is down, not up. And think about it. You go down to the street corner, you knock on your best buddy's door. Hey, you got any pot today? Oh, sure. A hundred bucks. Yeah, that'd be great. Here's your pot. Now, what's missing from that picture? Well, I'll tell you what's missing. I'm glad you asked. The seller neglected to check. Oh, proof of age. You can't get into the front door of a Colorado pot shop, medical or not, without proof of age. And let me tell you how careful they are. I went to our neighborhood medical shop, um, properly licensed from my two-level back fusion. Helps me keep the opiates at a minimum. I wish you could say zero, but I can't. And pot helps it certainly does and i've been dealing with this particular establishment for a number of years now i went in a month ago and they looked at the same stuff my red card marijuana medical card and my driver's license proof of age and they looked up me and they said do you know your driver's license is expired i said well no (laughs) They said, well, I'm sorry. We know you. We've seen it before. Doesn't matter. You have a passport, go get it. And these are friends. These are people that know me by name, that I love, that are wonderful. There's no way in hell they would have sold me one joint because my license was expired. And we're talking Mm -hmm. happily, I still have hair, and a lot of it is pretty gray. My beard is gray. And oh, by the way, I'm 65 years old, not 22. It didn't matter. That's the kind of regulation we are seeing. I'm a fan. I was thrilled they sent me away. And in fact, I said to them, thank you for sending me away. You must do that. I didn't want them feeling mm-hmm. bad just because they knew me. <laughs> well, that's great. That's good. You're right. If you regulate it strictly, it, it makes a big difference. So, anyway, we're going we're to keep pushing here uh, over here in Utah, see what we can do. Uh, hopefully, people are waking up. We've got a new governor. It looks like we're going to be electing. I really, really hope Johnson. And uh, he's. I mean, he promised a lot of things that the old governor will not do, and I think this is one of them. So, anyway. Well, we can hope. And let me tell you why I know you're right. Here's why I know you're right. There are two things that drive politicians. One, what do I need to do to get a vote and not lose a vote? Two, Money whether it's in their pockets, in their state coffers. So between money and votes, we know what they're going to do. We are not going to have a politician, oh, and let me go out on a limb and say Florida, where 58% of the vote, they needed 60, 58% voted to legalize medical pot. When a politician looks at that, you will never convince me they look at it and say, well, 58%, they needed 60, we won. Yeah, right. They're going to look at it and say, son of a bitch, 58%, we lost that election. And unless we get our heads on the right end of our bodies, we're going to lose our election. Nothing worse to a politician than losing an election. Here's, Here's something. Did you know, I saw an unofficial poll that was taken in Utah that showed that majority wanted medical marijuana, approved of medical, medical marijuana in Utah. But still, you can't get the, the legislators on board. Um, they will up. follow this, this the... This is why I, I, I'm looking at down the road, you know, this is why I'm more upbeat now than I ever was before. Because more and more people are getting on the bandwagon. And, and uh, oh my gosh. But the big problem is, is you got people like pharmaceuticals, and they have so much clout. They control Congress, they control state legislators, uh, and they've got 
billions and billions of dollars in profit. They're addicting everybody to their Xanax and everything else and depressants and antidepressants. I call them depressants. And it's, it's just so hard to break break through the opposition. Um, but we'll get through. It, it, I, th- I can't see it. it. It's one way or the other. It's just that we're flooding the gates. Yeah, it's going to come through. The gates are going to fall. My analysis leads... My analysis leads me to two things that are changing the dynamics, the numbers, the, the metrics. Oh, I got to use the word metrics. I like that. So here's what I see. One, when you look at the graph of who supports and who has opposed legalization over, say, the past, I believe the one I saw is about 50 years. And what we saw was baby boomers going from fairly high support to a giant valley where support fell way off. Then it came up again, and over the last couple of years, it's been the highest that it's been in 50, 60 years. And I attribute this to two things. One, running the numbers in my head, baby boomers kids are now grown up enough so their baby boomer parents are not as afraid of the kids smoking a joint or snorting a line or whatever it is they're past that hurdle for better or worse so that opposition dropped dramatically and there's another factor as some of us age our friends and I, and I would love to be wrong More and more people we know, whether it's our elderly great aunt or the great aunt's next door neighbor or a friend, what we are seeing with age is more and more cancer, more and more chemo, and as a tragic result, more and more of our friends and relatives who are no longer 25, but are 65 or 85. And... They're saying to us, our 70-year-old friends are saying, I could not eat on chemo, and now I can eat, I have an appetite, I feel better. What more can you ask? So with those two factors together, I think that plus LEAP, normal, DPA, SSDP, MMP, and on and on, working together. We're accomplishing what we set out to do. It is working. And I I can tell you in Colorado on Amendment 64, recreational, but for LEAP, active participation in the state of Colorado, including the brilliant TV spots near the election day by our LEAP member, Tony Ryan, who we all know and love, I think either... Leap's participation pushed it over the top to victory, or at the very least, accounts for the 3 or 4% more votes than the poll said we were supposed to get. And from what I learned through that election, when they do a poll these days, if it's off by a point or two, they're scratching their heads trying to figure out what's wrong. So when they're off by 3 to 4 points, they are truly astonished. And that is what we saw. Uh-huh. You're so thank to make you, Tony effort. Ryan. The, you know. the opposition is still trying to make an effort there. There was an article in our paper here just about two weeks ago. It actually, it was in the, all the Utah papers. It said traffic fatalities have doubled uh, under marijuana, actually, basically. And so they... We found out that uh, I did an investigation of that, and I talked about it on the radio. Um, that, hey, wait a minute. They're now testing for metabolites. <laughs> okay. uh, and, and, and they're now testing uh, almost twice as many as they before did before. It used to be they didn't test as many of the fatalities to see if it was in there. So when you test twice as many, you're going to get twice as many, <laughs> you know, as before. I- I try to explain that. Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. The headline. Yeah, but the headlines made it 
they just skew, skewed the whole thing to make it look like it's more dangerous than ever. I might add an R to the word skewed, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, we get people don't realize they read. 10 times as many marijuana-related traffic fatalities. Nobody bothers to tell them we're testing 20 times as many people. We're drawing blood and testing for THC. And guess what? We never did that before. We tested for alcohol. We tested um, typically breath. Now, in my practice, I'm seeing blood, 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 blood. And if, if it looks like no alcohol... Then they draw blood and look for THC, and, oh, by the way, they also look for 10 or 12 other families of drugs, ranging from barbiturates to hallucinogens. So not oh, only yeah. are they looking for the pot now, but, yeah, they're going through this polydrug screen, and then if they get a positive back, then they first do the real testing, the, the mass spectroscopy and the stuff that is not a, prone to uh, false positives. Oh, wow. you can hear the frustration in my voice. Yeah, you can skew those statistics any way that you want. Oh, man. It is something. So, They're lies, anyway. bam, lies, and statistics. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You yes, have sir. to look behind the scenes of all that. Now, I, uh, one of the things, I, <laughs> I've been on the radio every Friday here the last couple of years. Thank uh, you. It's a, it's a dial station. It's a, uh, you know, the Kate Daly show. Fox, it's actually a Fox News, kind of a rogue Fox News station. station. Huh. And uh, when I first talked about this, we talked about a lot, of, a lot of things, but when I first started talking about, you know, marijuana legalization and all that, and you get people, oh, I don't know, you know, what about this and what about that? And I uh, shouldn't we do that, you know. But now I get no opposition at all, at least. Nobody calls in and argues with it. It's all, <laughs> it's amazing. And so hopefully we've had some kind of an effect here as, le as LEAP members. That uh, in, in southern Utah, as you know, among the U people of Utah is the most conservative, this, except for maybe Provo, this is the most conservative area of all of Utah. And to be able to get uh, inroads here, uh, I don't know, I, I consider wonderful. Aside from and in addition to everything positive anyone could say about the Mormons, I have to say, damn, but they had good taste in land. What a beautiful state. <laughs> well, yeah, most of it. There are parts that are pretty barren. But. Yeah, and and then you go south from from Salt Lake and... Oh, man. Hmm. Well, it's good. Especially if you go down Highway 89. That's really nice. Instead of taking the freeway. So Boy, I'd have to look at my map to see some things out there. We focused yeah. on Bryce and on Capitol Reef. And, of course, everything oh, yeah. in between, which is amazing. Yeah, it is. It's, it's very beautiful, and there's just so much to do. It's getting impacted now. You go over to Zion's, they say there's a waiting line, you know, Zion National Park, a waiting line to get in, and it's just filled with so many people now that it's just very, very popular, but it's very well, beautiful. Don't tell people that our experience in Bryce and that whole area was almost no traffic, no lines, mm -hmm. the temperature was fine, everything everyone said, oh, you know, wrong time of year, and... Blah, blah, blah. And, and happily, they were absolutely 100% wrong in everything. It could not have been better. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. Or friendlier. Nobody said, oh, man, you look Jewish. I, you know, I don't know if we're allowed to let you in here. <laughs> it no, was, no. I mean, well, one thing, is, one thing is for sure, it's time to say, get out, get out of here. It's the end of the hour, so no matter who you are, we love you, but we got to wrap it up. So we're going to let our joint guest give a spotlight on a favorite organization or website. Thank you. Appreciate that. 
I want everybody to contact LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, L-E-A-P, dot C-C. You'll find a wealth of information there on everything that you, in, in, involving the drug war. And it's what a resource you can use when you're talking to everybody else. And your honor? I'm just sitting here outside on the front porch thinking, when we are done, I am going to enjoy smoking a legal bowl. My back will feel better. And I had to get around southern Utah legally because that's what I do without any of that particular medicine. And it was unpleasant, unpleasant. The opiates by themselves didn't work as well. <laughs> Did it's, you want to give short, a shout out for your canary? My canary app. My canary app dot com. We have come right. up with an iPhone app that allows you to measure your personal performance compared to your baseline personal performance. So we're not looking at useless chemistry. We're looking at reaction time. We're looking at things that matter with driving. MyCanaryApp.com. And I want to remind people that we are heard all around the Internet, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can listen to us on iHeartRadio in your car. You can also enjoy us on Roku TV. And remember, the next time you hear me, you'll know that it's time for hemp. Look at all that money, yeah, the money that they spent. Take another look and spend some time for him. Don't cut trees for paper, cause it hurts the environment. Stop deforestation, yeah. Education and information. See what all the buzz is all about. It's time for hemp. It's time for hemp. 